Realize that you have a hand, you have the power to create your body the way you want it. Today on stage, you have to be as big as you can be, as muscular as you can be, as ripped as you can be, and as freaky as you can be. I think that we are a little bit obsessed. Bodybuilding is not body disruption. If anyone thinks that there's no drugs in all sports, they're living in a vacuum. I am 100% drug free. Bodybuilding gives you power, gives you energy. I really respect these guys that go out there and do it naturally because they've really got to pay attention to their diet and their supplements. I'll pick poses that are going to make me look bigger than I really am. Because that's what this sport is all about, the sport of illusions. I don't want to sound cocky or anything, but I'm going to go out there expecting a win. year, thousands of people from all over the world gather for the ultimate bodybuilding competition, Mr. and Ms. Olympia. The Olympia Expo hawks fitness products and celebrity bodybuilders are on hand to inspire hungry fans. Whether you're a fitness buff or a 98-pound weakling, the Olympia delivers muscle, mass, and mania. This is our Super Bowl bodybuilding and fitness right here. strong willpower, you have to have strong determination, and you must love what you're doing more than almost anything in the world. With the pros, it's a whole nother ballgame because you're talking about working with the elite athletes in the world, the best. The guys you see at the Olympia are the top 13 or 14 elite athletes in the sport. And when you qualify for the Olympia, you enter the elite group. You have to feel great, and you have to let everybody see that you know you feel great and that you are great. Backstage at the Olympia, athletes pump blood into their muscles, tan and oil their bodies, all in preparation to show off the quality and size of their physiques. Tanning is really one of the things that you're judged on. You've got to understand they have to be really exaggerated tanning. You know, it's not just a normal tan like you and I have. It has to be really, really dark. It makes them glisten and it really just highlights and defines their physique. So you can just see their definition. <laughs> I'm the last person they see before they go up on stage, so it's very important that I make them look their best. They're presenting that total package, therefore I must make sure every body part is completely in view. If there's too much oil in one spot and not enough on another, it's going to take away from their symmetry. It could do nothing but mess up their body, so all that time, effort, money that they put into their contest could be completely axed. A panel of IFBB judges await the start of competition. We judge them for their muscularity, for their symmetry, and their proportions, and their definition. There are seven compulsory poses highlighting arms, legs, abdominals, and back. Each competitor tries to emphasize their strengths and hide their weaknesses. The size in itself won't make you win. The quality of the muscle itself won't make you win. It's a combination with symmetrical development. That's the key. Every part of your body has to be symmetrically developed to the other parts. And they all have to be at their top level. If somebody comes in with a huge massive chest and massive biceps and shoulders, but they've got weak legs, they're gone. Symmetrical posing is means you show the left and your right side of your body exactly the same way. Then we do a comparison where we put two or three fellows together. That's really where you can really get down to the nitty gritty. Because everybody looks good by herself. At this level, these guys are all champions. So when you see them by themselves, you're going to say, wow, this guy's great, this guy. You put them together next to each other, and that's where you decide who's first, who's second, who's third. What goes on in the pose down, it's a culmination of all three rounds, and it's the athletes trying to outdo one another. So if one guy does a pose, the other guy's saying, look, I can do it better, and he's trying to prove to the judges, I'm better than this guy. The pose down is where the bodybuilder's charisma and confidence shines through. It is a free-for-all, and the audience loves it.
Olympia champion, Ronnie Coleman. The Olympia purse is $435,000 unevenly split between the men and women. Top prize is $30,000 for the women split between two weight classes. $110,000 for the men, winner takes all. Prize money aside, to win the Olympia is the brass ring that promises product endorsements, guest posings, and supplement support. It really takes discipline to, to make it to the top in anything, and especially bodybuilding, because it's not like the training takes all day, but you're involved with your body all day. Bodybuilding is, is made up of three th stages. One is a competitive sport. Two is a lifestyle. And three is an art. Training begins at the gym. Gold's Gym in Venice Beach, California is considered the mecca of bodybuilding. Whether you are an amateur or a pro, the goal is to become ripped and shredded, to see the physiology and shape of the muscle through the skin. For some people, no matter how hard they train, if they do not have the proper genetics, they will never achieve the desired look. Genetics, you have to have proper skeletal system. They gotta have wide shoulders, gotta have narrow waist, hips, they gotta be in proportion. See, what I'm doing is shoulders or delts. And the reason I wrap the dumbbells with these is because I can't really grip the weight during the course of the exercise because the weight gets pretty heavy on my hands. Bodybuilder Craig Titus has been training for 11 years, eight of which has been geared towards becoming a professional athlete. Because I'm dieting, I'm just uh, burning interstitial fat out of my muscle, shaping my muscle and uh, creating a look that I need for stage rather than trying to build, so I lighten the weight to avoid injury. See, that got heavy. That got heavy as hell. The idea is to sculpt your muscles to fit your skeletal frame, to have the least amount of body fat in proportion to actual muscle size. Heavier weight creates more mass. Less weight with increased repetitions creates more definition. This past year was the biggest I've ever gotten. I was 274, I'm five foot nine. I still have to put another 15 pounds of muscle on. The amateurs, I mean, they're just so hungry because they want to get to where, you know, like the Ronnie Coleman's and the Flex Wheelers and the Chris Cormier's and the Nossers and all these, you know, the guys that they're idolizing in the magazine. Amateur bodybuilder Travis Wojek trains alongside the pros. At age 20, he is just entering the sport on a competitive level as a natural bodybuilder. It's a tough thing coming into the bodybuilding world because everybody tells you what you should be doing. And coming in, especially as an amateur and as a beginner, you have to realize that everybody's an expert. Everybody's an expert on their own body, and you have to find what works good for you. This exercise here is one of the greatest isolation bicep workouts with the elbow against the leg keeps it in a position where it's always tensed. So the veins coming out real nicely here. It means they like this exercise. <laughs> Across town, Stan McQuay starts his day at the gym. Trying to wake up. Like Travis, Stan is a natural bodybuilder. After attaining three black belts in the martial arts, Stan has been building muscle for 10 years. This year, he turns pro. Bodybuilding is definitely growing in, in the aspect of different types of people. Come on, wake up. Yeah, especially now that the natural shows are coming up, you don't have to be a freak anymore and they can see that, hey, we can just take natural supplements and uh, compete. I'm not trying to get big and huge, you know. I try to stay uh, nice and symmetrical, still pleasing to the average person so that when they come to a competition, they can actually say, I'd like to look like that. And it is easily obtainable. Not easily, but it is obtainable. I see definitely a push for natural bodybuilding. I see guys that are training in the gym, they want to look cut, they want to look muscular, but they don't want to look huge. First of all, it's the hardest sport in the world to turn pro at. When you're professional, you can make money at it. And when you're amateur, you don't. Basically, the difference is when you become a professional bodybuilder, you get paid for absolutely everything you do. Photo shoots, magazine covers, endorsements, guest posing seminars, guest speaking, and even your prize money. And in an amateur, you don't get paid prize money. In several weeks, Travis Wojcik and Stan McQuay will be competing in the bodybuilding competition, Muscle Mania. Open to amateurs as well as professionals, its distinction is that it is a natural bodybuilding contest.
I qualified to become a pro back in May in New York, and uh, I'm entering this competition as a pro. So it's going to be a little bit different, a little more pressure. Uh, now there's money involved, so it's a, a lot more at stake here. Being involved in a sport, you always want to rise to the highest ranks as possible in that sport. That's why you're in it, to rise to the top, to be the best. If I can become a pro being natural without taking the drugs and being healthy and um, inspiring people to be healthy, just wait and see. If that is possible, I will do it. What is perfection? The classic sculpted Michelangelo's David or the Farnese Hercules, the massive, more developed look? As the aesthetics of the body have changed, so have the physiques. Now, bodybuilding has always been dominated by the heavily massive developed physique. Today on stage, you have to be as big as you can be, as muscular as you can be, as ripped you can be, and as freaky as you can be. You have to be like that, otherwise you're not going to win the competition. I'm the leanest guy to ever win the, the Mr. Olympia contest, especially three times. When I won it, at five foot nine, I weighed 190, between 185 and 190. Today in bodybuilding competition, if you're not 250, you're considered thin. When you go to competition like the Mr. Olympia competition, you want to see guys looking freaky. You want to see the bigger guy come out at 22 and jump. Holy mackerel, look at the bone, bone flexing, rocking the whole stage. People getting fired up. They want to see that. That's what it takes in bodybuilding. People want to see those guys looking so freaky. The audience loves it. And now for the last 16 years, it's been the massive trend. Nobody is concentrating on developing symmetry of proportion shape and definition anymore if you take a bunch of guys like 20 guys that weigh 190 pounds 200 pounds of beautiful symmetry you're gonna get this because people want to see the big guy they want to get excited to see the huge muscles like a cartoon Just as the physiques of the body have changed, so has the science of lifting weights. Early on, weightlifters and fitness enthusiasts utilized free weights, commonly called barbells and dumbbells. Machines were developed to replicate weightlifting exercises. They enable people to lift weight with more control and safety. A machine can isolate an individual muscle more completely through a full range of motion. With a free weight, there is room for error because of imperfect form, which can lead to injury. I got a lot of machines because I went through shoulder surgery, which is right after my uh, last Mr. Olympia contest. I couldn't do certain exercises. And so uh, with the machines, I can do them. See, actually, even this lightweight is feeling pretty good. Over time, as technology became more sophisticated, the design of the machines became more muscle-specific. Today, there is no one standard as to what works better to build muscularity, which is why bodybuilders use machines in combination with free weights. Bodybuilding has an interesting history. The start of bodybuilding began in the 1890s with Eugene Sandow, who, by the way, is the model for the Mr. Olympia trophy. He was one of the forerunners of developing the perfect body. He was a more an all-around acrobat, strong man, and performing feats of strength. Next was Steve Reeves in the 50s. And Reeves, in my opinion, was the most proportionate, good-looking bodybuilder of all time. He really had it all. I used to read comic books, like the Incredible Hulk comic books. And then one day I discovered a muscle magazine, Muscle Power, and Dave Drape was on the cover. And I realized that bodybuilders did exist. So then I took it home and I learned about, you know, Mr. America, Mr. Universe, and then I got bitten by the iron bug. I started working out when I was 13. The old uh, Charles Atlas thing, I wanted to get muscles. I was skinny, young, I wanted to attract some girls, and I started lifting weights. When I was a kid, I saw a Hercules movie with Steve Reeves. But when I saw that film when I was about 10 years old, I wanted to come home and lift weights. I wanted to look like Steve Reeves. We all need heroes. That's why I'm trying to build heroes, and Arnold, I knew, could be one of them. My relationship with Arnold and him with me is the complete story of my life work. I saw pictures of him in Europe. He was strong looking and he was 
big and bulky. When we were running the Mr. Universe contest in Florida, and I invited him to come, and actually he came and participated in the event. He took second next to Frank Zane. And when I saw him on stage and met him, I knew that the man had an iron will, iron determination, wanted to learn badly, and I knew he loved the sport. 1968 for the Mr. Universe when I beat Arnold, I guess that was when I made my mark in bodybuilding. And Arnold, he had just come to America. He was still very young. I think he was only about 21 years old. Couldn't speak much English and was what we call in bodybuilding smooth. He didn't have much definition. I think I was with him well, for a week after the show. I showed him how to pose and how to control his muscles and so forth. And he really greatly improved because he had a lot of muscularity, but he didn't know how to show it. And I said, Arnold, would you want to go to California? And if I can send you to the old original gold gym where a lot of our champions were training, you would be in, among them all and you would be able to pick up a lot of the training methods and ideas and so forth. And he said yes. But Joe Weider told me, he says, he thought that Arnold would be the greatest bodybuilder of all time and, and for a long time. He dominated the sport for many years. Arnold did lots for bodybuilding. I'm looking to build a classical looking body such as those the bodybuilders back in the golden era of bodybuilding, back in the 70s, back when Arnold ruled, and of course he still does, his presence is always around. Here in the gym, Gold's Venice, touching the same weights that he has touched, sends a bolt of electricity through your body. I pay $535 for this 350 square foot room, two blocks away from the beach, ten minutes away from Gold's Gym Venice. I get so happy to eat my food. This is my second meal of the day. Already had my rice, this is my chicken. I wake up in the morning, I plop down from the sky rise, grab my burner, and I walk on over into the bathroom. Plug it in, turn it on, come over here. I boil my eggs. I have seven eggs, two whole eggs, and five egg whites. Three, three, six, and seven. Fill it up with water, put it on the hot burner, and when I hear it boiling and I'm in the shower, I will reach out and turn it off. Like my fireplace? I actually put these pictures together. If someone did not believe that I was natural, they can look at my development as I progressed. There's all my uh, homies at San Diego State. There's me right there. It's my freshman year. I wanted to be a football player. And I loved wrestling as well. The only thing that stopped me was my knees, my injuries. So the only thing that stopped me was myself. I am absolutely living my dream right now. One day, I'm going to wake up and my dream is going to be a reality. The reason why I got into bodybuilding is it's a long story. It's a little different than most people. When I was growing up in high school, I was hanging around with the wrong, wrong type of guys, um, hanging around with a lot of gang members. I wasn't really deeply into the claiming territory, but you know, we went out if we had to throw down or fight with another crew, we, you know, we did. I grew up, I was a skinny kid. I was very insecure. I would never, you'd never see me walk around with shorts or a tank top on. So. I, I wanted to get in the gym and pump up as much as I could. You know, it took a while before I started seeing some improvements, but once you start seeing the little bulges coming out, you know, it, it just uh, makes you really excited and you just want to keep at it. A lot of my buddies I was actually hanging out with, they were in here also, so it was kind of like a hangout for us. But uh, as I got more into it, you know, a lot of my friends, they weren't interested, so they started leaving, but I just got hooked on it. I had genetics. You know, for bodybuilding, so I kind of steered away from the gangbang and, and got more involved in the sport. This guy's got a great physique right here. Definitely. He's got a lot going for him. Just keep working out. Every year I do a little guest appearance at a high school in East LA. They have a little bodybuilding club. And what I'll do is I'll come and I'll do a guest appearance and I'll do a little spiel about what I did and what I went through. <laughs> Alright, let's do this. Have fun, bro.
rippling muscles on male bodybuilders inspire admiration and attract a strong fan base. However, take that same aesthetic and put it on a woman's physique and you have a different story. The world of women's bodybuilding has always been controversial. From the decrease in size of the purse to the increase of the size of the women's physiques, it is a sport that is in transition. The physique of the pro females have changed so much. You would look at a contest that I was in and look at a contest you know, two years ago, and you'd say, this isn't even the same sport. A perfect description is when people find out I'm ex-Miss Olympia, six-time Miss Olympia, and they go, oh, but you don't look like one of those bodybuilders that I see on TV. Corey Everson uh, did probably the most to keep women's bodybuilding popular because she was such a total package. She was good-looking, she had a great body, and she was charismatic. And then after that, I think the winners got more and more muscular and they had less of the total package. And now it's got to the point where there's no total package, there's just a lot of freaky muscle. In 1985, I ran the Miss Olympia in New York at the Old Felt Forum. We sold 5,000 seats and had to turn a couple of hundred people away. But as the physiques increased, the attendance dropped. You know, there's the argument that every athlete should be permitted to develop them, uh, themselves to the maximum. But to turn a woman into a man is uh, just a little too much. When I first started out, uh, my strongest body part were my legs. I came from, you know, tumbling background, track background, dance background, so I always had really genetic legs. My father had great legs. From the first time she picked up a weight, two years later she was a pro. My husband, who's my trainer, and I, we worked very, very hard to just bring out that overall package where no body part stood out from another body part. After three years of trying, Kim Chizewski won Ms. Olympia four times in a row. 